Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCLA. Welcome to the Promise Armenian Institute, uh, where we are holding the latest in our Distinguished Lecture Series. This one in special recognition of the 109th anniversary of the start of the Armenian Genocide of the early 20th century, which in fact began on April 24, 1915. My name is Professor Ann Karagosian, and I'm the director of the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to what I know will be a fascinating lecture entitled Imagining the Past, Atrocity, Trauma, and the Armenian Genocide, which will be delivered uh, by our distinguished Pulitzer Prize-winning poet and author, Professor Peter Balakian. Professor Balakian is the Donald M. and Constance H. Rebar Professor of the Humanities and Professor of English at Colgate University. His lecture will explore how his work has moved across generations in his writing both poetry and memoir about the Armenian Genocide. We are very much looking forward to his talk. I am also very happy to note that our event today is co-sponsored by the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, the UCLA Department of Comparative Literature, the Promise Institute for Human Rights at the UCLA Law School, the UCLA Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, the UCLA Nadekatsi Chair in Armenian Studies, the UCLA Working Group in Memory Studies, and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or Nasser, and finally the Ararat Iskijan Museum. We are so grateful to all of our co-sponsors for their support. And on behalf of the UCLA co-sponsors, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples. It is a privilege for our institution to acknowledge the history of the land on which we are established. Before we move on with our program and a more detailed introduction of our distinguished speaker, let me just mention a few procedural items. For those of you in the audience, please mute or silence your uh, phones, your cell phones. Let me note that this event is actually being recorded for future viewing on our Promise Armenian Institute YouTube channel, and in fact, should be visible right now on YouTube. Second, for those of you in the audience here, when the talk is concluded, please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question and we'll bring the microphone to you. Um, we look forward to your questions and queries that are uh, a little narrowly defined and succinct if possible. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Peter Balakian. He is the author of eight books of poems, four books of prose, three collaborative translations, and several edited books. Professor Balakian's collection Ozone Journal won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. His prose books include Vice and Shadow, Essays on the Lyric Imagination, Poetry, Art, and Culture, The Black Dog of Fate, a memoir, which was the winner, by the way, of the 1998 Penn Martha Albron Prize for the Art of the Memoir, as well as being a best book of the year for the New York Times, LA Times, and Publishers Weekly. The Burning Tigress is another of his book, the books, The Armenian Genocide and America's Response. This was the winner of the 2005 Raphael Lemkin Prize and both a New York Times notable book and a New York Times bestseller. His collaborative translation of Grigoras Balakian's Armenian Golgotha, a memoir of the Armenian Genocide, was a Washington Post book of the year, and I might add, was one of the most moving and impactful and gripping and horrifying and yet 
enlightening memoirs of an Armenian genocide survivor that I've ever read in my life. I would recommend this to all of you to learn more and appreciate more. Professor Balakian is the recipient of met, uh, many additional honors, too numerous to mention here. However, I will note that besides the Pulitzer Prize, he received both the Presidential Medal and Movses Khorinatsi Medal from the Republic of Armenia. He's received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship as well. He's appeared widely on national television and radio, and his work has been translated into many languages in addition. And of course, as I mentioned, he is a distinguished professor, chaired professor of the humanities and of English at Colgate University. So without further ado, let us welcome Professor Balakian to our stage uh, to hear uh, what he has to share with us. Um, I think my, has my mic been turned on? Good. You hear me fine. Okay, great. I'm going to ask you to bear with my allergies tonight. I apologize, but I'll work through them. <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Anne Karagosian. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a special, I've given hundreds and hundreds of readings truly in my life. I have never been hosted by an aerospace engineer. And it's and we're gonna work together and create something. I don't know, a poet and an aerospace engineer. So that I thank you very much. And Hasmik Bagdasarian, thank you so much uh, for all you've done to make all the details come together. It's great to be here in this institute. Um, I can tell you, I was thinking back to the numerous talks and lectures I've given at UCLA. And the first one was in the mid 1980s when Richard Hovhannisian, and I, I, I can't wait really to watch the whole symposium, but I hear it was a really special and fantastic event two weeks ago. Um, uh, Richard invited me out to do a reading from my then new book, Sad Days of Light which was uh, a second book of poems in a very Armenian memory book. <clears throat> and from there on, there have been various readings over the course of, of time. So this is special to return here and now. And I would very much um, like to have conversation after the reading. So I hope you'll be, you know, uh, aggressive in the right way. This week in April, we spend special time commemorating the catastrophe of 1915, the Armenian genocide. The contexts are many. The facts remain that between a million and a million and a half Armenians were mass killed by the Ottoman Turkish government. Hundreds of thousands to a million more sent into permanent exile one of the oldest indigenous populations of Anatolia and the Armenian highlands was expunged on its historic land. The event that Raphael Lemkin named the Armenian Genocide around 1943, as he was conceptualizing his idea of genocide as a crime in international law, came to be an important event for the 20th century and hence modernity. I've argued in my scholarly work that the Armenian catastrophe is the first genocide to be called modern. And that's to be uh, distinguished from forms of pre-modern genocide, which are as old as recorded history. But modern because <clears throat> the Ottoman government used modern technology and communications parliamentary legislation, organized bureaucracy, nationalist ideology for the purpose of targeting and eliminating an ethnic group in a concentrated period of time. 
the Turkish government's ensuing propaganda mill and program of denialism, the rewriting of the history of the Armenian genocide and imposing those lies on other nations is part of the scandalous aftermath of this history and has become itself, as many of you know, uh, a subject for scholars worldwide. It's become a whole industry to write about Turkish denial. Another fact remains, the past isn't over. It isn't even past, as Faulkner wrote. And as James Joyce put it, history is the nightmare from which I'm trying to escape, to which I respond, good luck. The trauma of catastrophic events is passed on down to successive generations in different forms. Ms. Muka Adanda said recently about her survival of the Rwandan genocide 30 years ago, it feels like it happened yesterday. As Helen Sperling, survivor of the Nazi concentration camp Ravensbrück, said to my students many times over the years when she would come to campus to lecture, my days are mine, but my nights belong to Hitler. Now I want to look at some images to ground my own reflections that will follow. And we can come back to them and reflect on them later if you wish. I think I just hit this, right? I have the down button going. Is there something that I should point it at that I'm not? Huh. Well, <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, weird, huh? Okay. Um, <clears throat> an important visual image maps are, right? And so, you can see deportation routes and centers of mass killing down to the southerly Derzor, where about 400,000 Armenians perished, probably the largest cemetery of the Armenian genocide. This is kind of an Ur image, isn't it, of Armenians being marched out of Harpert under armed guard in May of 1915. Most of the people on this march, it has been told to me by a number of people over the years, are believed to have been uh, professors at um, Anatolian College uh, in Harpert. And um, it tells us something about not only the mechanisms of deportation, the organized mechanisms of deportation, but the particular targeting of intellectuals and cultural leaders. And we'll look at more of that in a second. From the Armin T. Wegner photographs, this time of year, we come to that deep reflection, these photographs emerge with their granular intensity. This could be any of our grandmothers, great-grandmothers, <clears throat> aunts, women in camps in the Syrian desert, The face of genocide anywhere on the planet at any time. It's a universal image, isn't it, of the human species at its worst. Now, I am going to say something about my uh, my great, actually my great great uncle. Uh, um, he'd be born too far back for me to be a great uncle, and uh, and I appreciate your reflection on Armenian Golgotha. 
I'm going to say some things about my great uncle uh, later in my talk. But as we think about why we commemorate the Armenian genocide on April 24. Of course, we're focused on that night when the 250 cultural leaders were arrested um, by the Ottoman government and brought to the central prison in downtown Constantinople uh, before they were deported by ferry and then by train and then by... Uh, horse and carriage to the Chankari prison, about 200 miles west of Constantinople, Istanbul. So here are some of Armenia's cultural leaders of that moment, who were really in the throes of an awakening of a kind of Armenian cultural, literary, artistic modernism. When we think about what is lost in genocide, we don't want to forget the importance, the significance of expunging culture. Lemkin was very focused on that himself. The, the significance of expunging culture, uh, the silencing of the identity of an ethnic group by eradicating its schools, churches, mosques, synagogues, its uh, libraries, its museums, and of course, its cultural producers all the artists, visual, literary, and otherwise, um, editors, magazines, all of it, journalists, all of it is a target in the Genocide Act. So Krikor Zorab, as you know, he was a member of the Ottoman parliament. Daniel Varujan, really important poet, those of you who read Varujan in Armenian uh, know that better than I do, but I love his work as I know it in translation. The same with our friend Adam Yarjanyan, my grandfather's good friend, uh, my grandfather Diran Balakian, the physician who wrote the letters back to his friend Adam Yarjanyan from the, from the medical relief work he was doing, my grandfather was doing in Adana in April and May of 1909. So I have a particular connection to Siamanto, and I did collaboratively translate Garmir Lude Paragames, and that does exist in English now. And it's actually become a pretty popular book in a certain, certain pathway in modern poetry. <clears throat> the great Komitas, if he didn't die physically, as we know, he suffered a mental collapse from which he never recovered. Zabel Yassayan, who thankfully was not uh, arrestable on the night of April 24. She was out of the city, out of the country, actually. My great uncle, Krikoris, we'll talk about him in a bit. Takeon, also out of the, he was in Cairo. So some of our cultural figures survived because of, uh, as often happens, that word luck. Every survivor I've ever met says, you know, for all the attributes you want to attribute to so-and-so survival, luck has to be a significant card in that deck. So thank God Takeon wasn't in Turkey. And Charence, of course, was, uh, joining a uh, battalion uh, of, of, of uh, fighters, Armenian fighters, who came down from over the Russian border into northeast Turkey. And he wrote that amazing uh, poem called Dante-esque Legend about his witnessing of the killing fields. That's a great poem. Again, I only know it in English, but I've written about it and I teach it. So there's our friend Charantz, national poet, as you know, in Hayastan. Well, this happened to be in, I, you know, 25 years ago almost, I put on this event at the New York Public Library with my dear and late friend Vartan Gregorian, 82 writers killed in the Armenian Genocide. We did a tribute to them and compiled a list of all of them. Okay. We can come back to those if you if you want. 
Today, I would like to explore briefly how this historical past has come to shape some of my work as a poet and literary nonfiction writer. I start by noting that in the complex relationship between subject and form, the necessity of the imagination to, to transform any subject with the materials of one's art is essential. A subject by itself is just raw data. The artist, the poet in my case, must engage the subject with his, her particular technique, materials of craft. For poetry, that is compressed language, phrases, enjambed lines, stanzas, and of course, images, tropes, metaphors that create in the end, one hopes, a voice. When I began writing in the 1970s, I was influenced by the modernists, especially Yeats, Eliot, Hart Crane, and the 50s confessionalists, Robert Lowell, Theodore Retke, Sylvia Plath, Allen Ginsberg. I was and still am writing about all the things poets take on, love, death, war, art, culture, the human body, the natural world, and of course, history, my subject tonight. In the mid 70s, I began writing some poems that were dreaming back to riff on Yeats's phrase to a history that preceded my life. That history was animating me largely through my knowledge of the experience of my grandmother's Armenian genocide survivor story, an experience that had been transmitted to me in indirect ways at first, through veiled gestures, dropped phrases, interrupted conversations, and folk tales and dreams. Later, after my grandmother's death, I learned about my grandmother's death march story from her eldest daughter, my Aunt Gladys, who was one of the two daughters, toddler daughters, who survived with my grandmother in the summer and fall of 1915. Otherwise, everyone in my grandmother's family was, was, um, was massacred. My Aunt Gladys <clears throat> relayed her memories of dark, violent images to me. And I write about this in my memoir, Black Dog of Fate, which is a family memoir, as you know. It's a family story. It's much less a me story. It's about them, and it's about history. I also came to understand more about the history, about this history in my 20s by reading history and survivor and bystander narratives. And then in 1980, I had a jolting revelation when my Aunt Gladys showed me a long buried document in a family dresser drawer, a legal document entitled Claims Against Foreign Governments, filed by my grandmother in New Jersey in 1920. She was able to file this through the US State Department because her late husband, Hagop Chilingurian, he died on the death march, was a naturalized U.S. citizen living just north of Boston. He had come back to get them. And as her widow, she had the right to make a claim for losses incurred from the Turkish government's criminal actions. The claim contains a narrative about what happened to her and her family in August 1915, a family of wealthy merchants in Diyarbakir, southeastern Turkey today, including a roll call of her murdered family from her father and mother, Karnig and Lucine, 75 and 50 years old, to her brothers and sisters and sister-in-laws and brother-in-laws and nieces and nephews, the, young of, the youngest of whom were two years old. These texts and testimonies further amplified for me Yeats, 
T.S. Eliot, Robert Lowell, Robert Hayden, Adrian Rich had already opened the door. But these texts and testimonies further amplified for me, a young poet, the sense that history could be a force in the literary imagination and that the poem had special qualities to ingest histories of violence. I began writing poems that probed the Armenian Anatolian world in which my grandmother and her family had lived and the death march they endured. I wanted to capture something about my grandmother's horrific experience and traumatic aftermath. And something is the, I would underline because the artist who comes along after can just capture a filament, a mica shard, but that's all you need as a writer, because you need granularity as a writer. You're not looking for large conceptual realities. Scholars do that. I wanted to, um, as I say, capture something about my grandmother's horrific experience and traumatic aftermath. And my early poems in this zone were published in literary journals in the late 70s. And that told me also that editors were paying attention. You know, it was interesting for me. Poems called The History of Armenia, from my grandmother coming back, Road to Aleppo, First Nervous Breakdown, 1920. These were interesting to American editors of literary magazines. The U.S. always has uh, a cosmopolitan dimension to it. Out of my grandmother's human rights lawsuit, I made a collage poem I entitled The Claim, and that appeared in my 1983 book, Sad Days of Light. That poem opened up new formal paths for me and my interest in the collage poem. And in a broad sense, I felt that these Armenian poems freed me from some of the confinements of mimetic realism. I drew psychic and emotional energy from my grandmother, whose survivor's story haunted me. I was interested in blending textures of realism with elements of dream and what I would call surreal-like dislocations, as in the history of Armenia, in which the nervous breakdown of my grandmother's genocide aftermath collides with the peaceful post-war suburban landscape of Eisenhower's America. And so I'll read you this poem, which came out in my first book. It's called The History of Armenia. It's reprinted in Sad Days of Light, so I'm, I'm reading it from there. I was 26 when I wrote this. Last night, my grandmother returned in the brown dress standing on Oriton Parkway where we used to walk and watch the highway being dug out. I'll just say one thing. This is Northern New Jersey, East Orange, New Jersey, just a stone's throw from Patterson and Newark. That's where this poem is set. I'll start over. Last night, my grandmother returned in the brown dress, standing on Oriton Parkway, where we used to walk and watch the highway being dug out. She stood against the backdrop of steam hammers and bulldozers, a bag of fruit in her hand, the wind blowing through her eyes. I was running toward her in a drizzle with the morning paper. When I told her I was hungry, she said, in the grocery store, a man is standing to his ankles in blood. The babies in East Orange have disappeared, maybe eaten by the machinery on this long road. When I asked for my mother, she said, gone, all gone. The girls went for soda. Maybe the Coke was bad, the candy sour. This morning, the beds are empty, water off, the toilets dry. When I went to the garden for squash, 
only stump was there. When I went to clip parsley, only a hole. We walked past piles of gray cinder and cement trucks. There were no men. She said, Grandpa left in the morning in the dark. He had pants to press for the firemen of East Orange. They called him in the middle of night. West Orange was burning. Montclair was burning. Bloomfield and Newark were gone. One woman carried the arms of her child to West Orange last night and fell on her uncle's stoop. Two boys came with the skin of their legs in their pockets and turned themselves in to local officials. This morning, sun is red and spreading. If I go to sleep tonight, she said, the ceiling will open and bodies will fall from clouds. Yavri, where is the angel without six fingers and a missing leg? Where is the angel with the news that the river is coming back? The angel with the word that the water will be clear and have fish. Grandpa is pressing pants. They came for him before the birds were up. He left without shoes or tie, shirt or suspenders. It was quiet. The birds, the birds were still sleeping. In the 1990s, I wrote a memoir, as I've noted, a, a family story. I am the I am the teller of the story, and it's through my perspective that you're seeing the generations. But I wrote Black Dog of Fate that dealt with growing up in sunny, affluent suburbia in the 1960s and the repressed trauma and silence in my family in the wake of the violent past. I grew up in a family where this history was not spoken about, where it was kept under wraps. And what I got interested in in Black Dog of Fate was tracing the leakage of traumatic psyches in the family across generations. Tracing the leakage. Because even there, in that sunlight of good times suburbia, Tenafly, New Jersey, 1960s, uh, the darkness of the past leaked through. And I got, I'm interested in those hieroglyphs. Then the story will take off into my adult engagements with the Armenian Genocide. But at first, it's about the encodings. I found in literary nonfiction, narrative and story, character, dialogue, scenes and unfolding plot, and always, of course, the poet's need for deep image construction. I found in this form another way to ingest the traumatic inherited past. In this scene, I'm introducing my grandmother. She's the hero of the book, if that word is useful. She's the psychic energy of the book, of the story. So here from an early part of, of the memoir, a chapter called The Woman in Blue. She's going to tell me a wild folk tale. I will not read that to you. It's way too complicated to read here, but I'll, I will give you a sense of how this chapter opens. When I was with my grandmother, I had access to some other world, some evocative place of dark and light, some kind of energy that ran like an invisible force from this old country called Armenia to my world in New Jersey. It was something ancient, something connected to earth and words and blood and sky. Now I realize that my grandmother's stories hibernated in me. 
until I was ready to understand them fully. Or maybe marinated is a better word since we are a people so steeped in food. Yes, marinated. Or is it cured like grape leaves and brine or lamb cooked in apricots, walnuts and pomegranate juice and left to soften in hardened fat in an earthenware jug? or long slabs of filet mignon packed in garlic and cumin and left to hang in the dark air of a basement. My grandmother liked to tell all of us her dreams, but it was to me when we were alone that she told her stories. Perhaps she had told the same ones to her daughters when they were young, although no one ever mentioned them. I came to realize that my grandmother's stories were part of time and not part of time, part of place and not part of place, part of the stuff that is stored in the mind's honeycomb. As a dream teller, my grandmother was accorded respect, albeit begrudgingly, by my father, the rationalist physician. I remember one morning overhearing my grandmother in the kitchen telling my mother about a dream she'd had the night before about an old friend from the old country who now lived in Fresno, California. Well, I'll stop that little segment there because it, it gets involved with a dream. But um, I just want to mention Fresno because that's my kind of grounding in California because my cousins who are still one cousin still in Fresno my other cousin Lynn is in <clears throat> is in Oakland but visiting my cousins in Fresno for us as kids was coming out to the great sunshine state the great golden state and that that was exciting and Fresno of course remains uh, you know an Armenian zone I know um Many years later, I discovered Marion Hirsch's book called Post Memory, uh, Writing in Visual Culture After the Holocaust. And, and Professor Hirsch, he's, he's a wonderful scholar, argues that poets, artists, writers, fiction writers, etc., who come along after an event happens. They've not been in the event. They come along after, but they're fixated on it because it has so impacted their their lives, their being, their imagination, their head, are, are writers of post-memory. So, if, you know, maybe that's useful for a writer like myself. There are many of us post-memory writers all over the world, but I throw that out there. The Armenian past has continued to percolate in my imagination for decades now. Fruits and vegetables, walking the ruins of Ani, a Kashan rug, coming to Istanbul, driving from Yerevan to Gyumri, sitting in a cafe in Paris, thinking about my great uncle, the bishop, who survived imprisonment and deprivation, having been arrested with the 250 Armenian cultural leaders on April 24. And more have all been ground for forays into the Armenian past for me. History colliding with the present. Continued visitations from my grandmother, Nafina. She won't leave me alone. Or is it I who won't leave her alone? So let me read you some poems. Um, these are from my recent book, No Sign. I have a section in this book of meditations on fruits and vegetables. And of course, they become more than just fruits and vegetables. They start unfolding and going places. And you've probably guessed some of those places are the Armenian past of 1915. And this poem is called Eggplant. I love the white moon circles and the purple halos on a plate as the salt sweat them. The oil in the pan smoked like bad days in the Syrian desert when a moon stayed all day, 
when morning was a purple elegy for the last friend seen, when the fog of the riverbank rose like a holy ghost. My mother made those white moons sizzle in some egg wash and salt. Some parsley appeared from the garden, and summer evenings came with no memory, but the table with white dishes. Shining aubergine, black-skinned beauty, bitter apple. We used our hands. This is called pomegranate. Persephone ate you and went to hell. My grandmother walked with you under her blouse, her two daughters hobbling with her. Every day one seed for each of them. Whatever death road they walked down, you were. Seed apple, garnet, cochineal, spiritus ovum, spiraling hawk dive of the soul, leather red skin for hard times. Sometimes she looked up at the moon and saw you. <clears throat> In this poem, I am sitting um, I am sitting at um, a cafe on the left bank of Paris, Les Deux Magots, famous literary hangout in the 20s. And many things are crisscrossing my head. Um, one of them has to do with my great uncle, Bishop Balakian, because after he survived the four years in the killing fields, he did return home briefly to Constantinople, and then he fled <clears throat> first. He went to Paris, and, went, and along with Nubar Pasha, he was one of the four Armenians at the Paris Peace Treaty representing Armenia, if there was an Armenia at the Paris Peace Treaty. Uh, there was, of course, in 1919. And um, he would later go on to be the bishop of the Armenian churches of South France and would preside over the building of a lot of beautiful churches there. And the other, <clears throat> there are many intersections in this poem. So I, I want you to think of this poem as poems of intersecting proximities and degrees of separation. But the, the event that triggers the poem is a literal event. Poems are not memoirs. Everything that happens in them is not literal. It did not have to happen to the writer of the poem. But poems are also a mix often of both. In this poem, I'm confessing to you that this is accurate. I was at the artist colony Yado in Saratoga Springs, a famous place. I spent many years there writing books when I could get three or four weeks away. And one of the poets, Dolores Kendrick and I struck up a lot of good conversation and Dolores was African American and we talked a lot about James Baldwin and I was telling her how much Baldwin meant to me and still does mean to me. And one day she said, you know, I talked to Jimmy a couple of times a week. He's dying, as you may know, of cancer in the south of France. Why don't you come with me to the pay phones, what we had in those days, this is the mid 1980s, and say hi to him and tell, you know, be, you know, express your fandom to him. Well, <clears throat> finally I got up the courage to do that. <clears throat> and that's, that gets into this poem in a significant way. This is called History Bitterness. A phone booth, August Yado. Saratoga Springs, air of the Tiffany parlor, sour scent of empty wine bottles. My friend handed me the sweating receiver, 
go ahead, say hello. What could I say to James Baldwin, who is dying in the south of France? No name in the street. Paris, Algiers, Little Rock, you can fill it in. I'm sitting in Les Deux Magots with my NY Yankees umbrella in my lap, a wide glass of wine from some vineyard of Burgundy in my hand, recalling, <clears throat> recalling that Baldwin sat here drinking scotch all day and writing as friends dropped by. And it hits me. Just over Pont de Sully, my great uncle sat in a big treaty room in 1919 representing Armenia. Did it exist? In a fancy hotel with others who hoped for a nation in return for the slaughter. Baldwin knew Sartre and de Beauvoir. He saw Camus pass by. It was 1958, and the Algerian cabbie who dropped him off drunk on the curb was half blind from the revolution. Bang, bang, bang goes the heart. Mr. Baldwin was dying in a sensual village in the south of France. After a week at Versailles, my uncle came to that hotel room where in the closet of his head, a big white sheet floated over the Black Sea. What did rape and massacre mean? Fail-proof, shattered, bitten off words that floated over the bridge into the carnival horns of night. A few months earlier, Miles Davis passed Baldwin at Le De Magot on his way to play for Louis Malle's En Censure pour l'Echafaud, the spurting air of love, 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 sl slipping from the valves, the spit and breath of night in Paris off the torpid brown Seine where Paul Salon had disappeared not long before. Hiss, hiss, hiss goes the heart. It's 1958, and Camus still walks the boulevard. The war in Algeria is daily acid in the river. What are degrees of separation? Private myths, illusions. My aunt, the surrealist, might call them chance meetings. Do we invent proximities for our need, for salvation, for love? Wilson, Clemenceau, Lloyd, George, names my uncle scrawled on a map of the dispossessed, on a wall in a hotel of cards where Dixieland horns played at the banquet for the Grand Army, and the next map of Europe was shuffled with an ace in the hole. Miles Davis spent hours with Louis Malle making some languid, piercing, hollow, sliding sounds in the indeterminate, dank night. No name on the street stalked him. A few years later, Baldwin moved just miles from where my father was born in Istanbul. A few years after the Armenians were expunged from Turkey and my grandparents left the ghost map on the wall. It was 1919 and the flu blew along Saint-Germain where my grandparents met my uncle that fall. I knew Baldwin's heart went hollow, languid, and sizzled with the need to get out of America. It even led him to the place my grandparents fled before they landed a couple miles from Baldwin's apartment in Harlem. Are these degrees of separation or just my way of thinking about that strange moment in a phone booth at an artist colony in the summer of 86. My friend said, if you love Jimmy's work, I know he'd love to hear from you.
all good news means a lot, especially at the end. What could I say to Mr. Baldwin? He'd helped me understand the bitter history that had trapped me, that was trapped in me. Istanbul, New York, Paris. No name, no street. I was sweating into the phone. Mr. Baldwin's voice was frail, but unmistakable. I'm going to close with two, two pieces. I want to read one more short passage from Black Dog of Fate and close, close with a poem called Coming to Istanbul. In this, in this moment in my memoir, my Aunt Gladys, for the first time in her life, has opened up and has begun telling me some real granular details about what happened. And I'm just chiming in here. There's much context. I'm not going to give it to you. We're in a hotel room in Paris. Interesting, Paris. Kind of the place of Paris for me. And uh, we've been having a con conversation. And, I, and, and she has begun to say a few things. And then I say to her, is that it? My aunt looked at me quizzically. Of your memories? My last memory is of Marseille. We took a ship from Beirut to Marseille, a wonderful steamship. All of us Armenian children ran on the decks day and night. My grandmother and her daughters had been living in Aleppo for five years. My grandmother worked as a seamstress to gather money to get them out. We took a ship from Beirut to Marseille, a wonderful steamship. All of us Armenian children ran on the decks day and night. It was exciting to be on that ship and going somewhere. When we got seasick, our mothers gave us turshi to settle the stomach. Whenever I smell turshi, for those of you who don't know, the pickled vegetables, I think of that ship. We stopped in Marseille for a week or so before taking a train to Paris. We were all women and children with hardly any money. And at night we were permitted to sleep in a Catholic church near the harbor, a big Baroque church with fancy carving and an enormous statue of the Virgin Mary. The ceilings were big vaults with cherubs, clouds, sun rays. The church was damp, and you could smell the harbor, the dirty salt water mixed with petroleum. I loved that smell because it meant we were going somewhere. We slept on woolen blankets, and most of us slept in the pews, which were smooth from years of use. But the women didn't sleep. I would wake in the middle of night and find all the mothers awake. After a few nights, I asked Mama why nobody ever slept. And she said, if we go to sleep, the ceiling will open and dead bodies will fall from the clouds. I remember just closing my eyes and trying hard as I could to go to sleep. I close with this poem. Um, I will tell you as context for this poem, it took me years to get the courage to go to Turkey. It was not an easy thing to do. So many demons batting around your brain, so much paranoia and anxiety. 
Finally, when I got up the courage or tr was trying to work up the courage, it was Tanner, who's now part of your institute here, and you're lucky to have him, although we miss him back in the Northeast. There was Tanner Akjam, my friend and my groundbreaking bridge to uh, the other world. It was Tanner who gave me the confidence to come. He said, I will arrange for meetings with progressive Turks. You'll see a whole new world uh, that you won't have imagined. And that got me, that got me uh, poised to go. And uh, Donna and I, who we flew from, we flew from Florence to Istanbul, met Tana Tanner the next day in downtown uh, kind of Taksim area. So I, I owe much to Tanner. We all owe much to Tanner for the work he's done uh, in mining Ottoman sources and making the uh, genocide of the Armenians a deeper, richer uh, history. So Tanner, this poem is literally dedicated to Tanner in the book. It's called Coming to Istanbul. And I'll tell you too, just Tanner's here in the audience, as you know, uh, the Ottoman historian in the book isn't Tanner. Tanner and I are at dinner with this other Ottoman historian, and that's just to, just to parse details here. And again, poems are always uh, uh, collages of imagination and fact. <clears throat> But the insignia of the poem is always truth. Coming to Istanbul. Follow the gaze of Athena down a cistern where water glows. Follow silver snakes along marmora and golden horn. Walk over the black plaque for her aunt Dink smack in the street in Shishli. Follow the ferry waves to Uskadar, where your father was born, where your uncle returned incognito from prison. Drink the split bourbon voice of Ray Charles in the cafe in Taksim under the red flags of star and moon, guns to the head, wild prayer, streets banging with pots and pans, rage at the dictator. Walk by in oblivion and terror, an American, an Armenian, black shirt under the olive trestled restaurant, hotel, rooftop, light rinsed Bosphorus, hot rocky fumes in the throat under the wind umbrellas and boutique glass facades of Beolu, galleries of blue mosaics, magenta carpets, the Ottoman historian pours you tan and wine into the sunset. Follow the lights on the bridge into the chandelier of the sky. Trompe l'oeil of gray wolves, voices of Turkish friends in the stone. Follow ghost signs, midnight cab, smashed cafe windows, night sea journey of beloveds. Byzantine dirt smoke roads, past tobacco Reggie and Sultana crates, Haider Pasha of Armenian soul death hour. Lost family, come greet me in your city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your artistry with us. This was magnificent. I think now we can open the floor for any questions or comments. Perhaps I'll start with one, uh, Peter, if you could share with us a little bit about the post-memory notion that you spoke about your grandmother's 
your aunts who really shared much more with you. What I have observed, at least in in my family and my grandparents, for example, who one experienced and saw death. She saw her father's death. She saw saw it there and she came to this country in 1920. She never talked about the genocide. Very, very rarely, I think she could not, perhaps like your grandmother. But then my grand, one of my grandfathers who saw a bit but then was able to escape, but then heard from others more secondhand. He he would talk about it a lot. Perhaps you could talk about this notion of post-memory and how it's influenced some of your writing? Sure. Yes, thanks, Anne. Um, it's interesting because my Aunt Gladys, the oldest of the daughters on the death march, and just to fill in the story simply that my grandmother remarried when she got to northern New Jersey in 1920, had two more daughters, my mother being the youngest of those daughters. And my mom's still with us at 97. And so that's an interesting continuity, continuity of time here. But, you know, and the, the post-memory idea that Marion Hirsch uh, uh, studies and articulates and theorizes is a notion that pertains to artists and writers. So it's about the imagination of the painter, the sculptor, poet, the fiction writer, the memoir writer. She spends a lot of time writing about Art Spiegelman's great um, graphic novel, Mouse, Mouse One and Mouse Two, you may know it. So she she's interested in the phenomenon of the fixation of a generation that's come after the event, hasn't been uh, physically harmed by the event, but that is psychologically uh, obsessed with the event and also has received the, the traumatic transmissions in whatever ways they may happen. That you've received something. I mean, I write about this. I'm not here to give a lecture about you know, this about Black Dog of Fate, but I write about this in Black Dog of Fate about, you know, the, 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 the psychological temperature uh, in the family when the traumatic past came up. And this would affect, you know, me. I won't speak for my siblings. I'm the oldest of four. Um, but yeah, this was, you know, you'd, it's, you start receiving messages about something that's so horrific that you find a hard time uh, finding words for it or imagining that your grandmother, you know, could have endured this, could have watched, could have, my grandmother, we, we don't know what she actually witnessed they were all arrested together in the first week of August of 1915. They were all put on the march and they were all murdered, but, but her and her two daughters and her first husband died. She said, you have to read the claim. Next time I do this talk, I'm going to have a PowerPoint of the claim, some of the pages of it. It is in Black Dog of Fate. Some of it is reproduced facsimile. And so um, my grandmother's own description of August of 1915 is here. You know, and when that was shown to me, a young, now I'm a young poet who already has a book out, actually. I've already been hired by a university to be a professor of literature. And my aunt shows me that document and it had a life-changing effect on my you know on, on me in many ways but on me as a writer as I tried to note in the earlier remarks I made so you may want to read Hirsch's book and see how she explores post-memory Michael hi Peter yeah thank you so much that was wonderful and um, that Baldwin poem really uh, blew me away, especially, I have to say. Okay. But um, I was listening partly as a Holocaust scholar also and thinking about 
you know, a lot of the similarities that I hear in what you're talking about in the case of the Armenian genocide and in what I know of the Holocaust. And one of the things was certainly this notion of post memory and a kind of inherited trauma across generations. And Mariana Hirsch is a friend of mine, and I always teach her work as well as Mouse. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about those similarities, but also wondering about possible differences, which I think are probably also there. And one in particular I was wondering about was has to do specifically with with your work as a poet. Um, another thing that I always teach is, um, you know, these writings by Theodor Adorno, German Jewish philosopher on poetry after Auschwitz. And he had this very famous uh, line that originally written in the late 40s, and he kept thinking about it and rewriting it, you know, to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Right. And uh, one of the poets he may have had in mind, in fact, was Celan, who shows up in your, your poem, which is one of the things that moved me about that. I was just wondering if, as a poet, you find yourself grappling also with that problem of, you know, can one, should one, how does one write poetry in the wake of yeah. this kind of catastrophe, right. in the wake of this kind of genocide? And sure. the events are different, and even more so, the aftermaths of the events are very different. Sure. And yeah. you're confronting a kind of denialism, which sure. is overpowering. But I'm just curious if you, if that's the kind of thing yeah. you find yourself thinking about. Yeah, well, thanks, Michael. That, the, the, you know, that's, you set out a whole day long symposium here, and it would be, a, it's a good one to have a group of writers and visual artists sit around and talk about that. You know, at first to just um, um, think about the Adorno statement, which is so, you know, famous and so much used in so many ways as a trope. Uh, and, and a signifier. I, I, I guess I've come over time to see that phrase as a call for a different kind of art. Not, not really a call to stop the imagination or give up in despair and, and the sense of being overwhelmed. But, 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 but to, you know, to reassess, to reassess what it's all about, what everything's all about. And, you know, many, many intellectuals of Adorno's generation had also grown up, um, you, you know, I, I would say, on some degree of late 19th century romantic writing. And I'm wondering, you know, if he's got that in mind, if he's got a romantic tradition in mind, because I don't know enough German intellectual, I don't know enough German literary history, uh, you know, to know his intellectual biography. But, you know, the call for a new language. Um, it's like hearing Allen Ginsberg and Howell use the phrase, who heard the crack of doom on the hydrogen jukebox. Like, so the first time you hear that phrase, in that great poem, it shakes you up in a way because you know you're you're in the nuclear age now. You can't take anything for granted. The human species is on a thin covering. I mean, over the earth. So I take Adorno that way, and Paul Salon was doing exactly. I mean, Paul Salon was as he as he's noted, and critics about him, if noted, he was tearing the language, tearing German up a bit. He, he, was, he, 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 he was taking it over in a way that was, I guess for him, necessary, uh, his own inventive poetics. And I think if, if it's a call for a starker, and more inventive poetics, it's a really, it's, it's a necessary uh, call. Um, but, but the fertility of the human imagination after catastrophe strikes me as an essential act of resilience, of rebirth, um, of rebirth, of affirmation, 
but I, I do think, and you, you know, you're also asking about the sense of, can you write about any of this? Cause it's so massive and it's, it's beyond us. But I think all the artist can do is grab hold of the filament, the granularity um, and make paintings or sculptures or plays or poems that can capture something, um, you know, whether it's Spiegelman's mouse or Anselm, Anselm Kiefer's paintings or Salon's poems or Primo Levi's nonfiction prose. Where would we be without those works? I mean, then, you know, the Nazis would have even done more damage or the Young Turks would have done more damage. Now, I do think, just to respond to your sense, the differences between the genocide of 1915 and the genocide in Central Europe of 1940, 45, uh, the differences have so much to do with also the aftermath and the perpetrator efforts to shut down the history, to excuse me, to rewrite the history, to propagandize, to lie, to cover up. And this has created a, a really monstrous double killing. I'm using Elie Wiesel's term. It's a monstrous double killing. And, you know, in the genocide studies field, the statement is made again and again that the denial of genocide is the final stage of genocide because it seeks to demonize the victims and rehabilitate the perpetrators. And it sends the message that, you know, massive acts of mass killing don't matter. And these things do embolden future perpetrators. So the, the double killing of the Turkish state has been a profound uh, and sinister double uh, part of the crime. I don't know, as a writer, uh, you write the best you can with your, with your materials. You know, you take, you've got to make it, you know, when I talk to my writing workshops, I'm telling my students, whatever your subject is, you've got to have your materials. And you have to know how to use them. You have to know what they are. As Yeats wrote in one of his last poems, Irish poets, know your trade. Make whatever is well made. You know, so I want to always emphasize that because I, I am here as a practicing artist as well as an artist who, for whom this past has had a huge impact. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It's been really excellent. Just listening to you is, is really, really great. Um, as a, a son of a genocide survivor, when my sister took my parents' house over behind the walls, she found my dad's tickets, third class, from Marseille to the United States. My dad had hidden it. But my question is on a more cheerful note. Um, many people have asked, what is your imagination if none of this had happened and all those great intellectuals and the professors and the doctors and everybody had stayed in Turkey and there was no, but they were getting along great with the Muslims. What would Turkey be like today? Yeah, well, of course, um, I'm interested in the Marseille tickets. Do they have a date on them? Do you, know, do you remember what the date is? No. Okay, check it. I'm interested. And in, notice they were on the same boat. Yeah. You know, that's a heavy question, a really uh, powerful question. And it's a question that I know uh, scholars and writers about the Holocaust uh, have, have explored deeply. What would Europe be like with a thriving Jewish population today? Uh, what would Anatolia, Turkey be like with a thriving multicultural population today. It's very complicated to answer because as we all know, hypothetical histories aren't anything more than imaginings. 
But my response is twofold. It's kind of paradoxical. Um, in one sense, if you were to imagine the best of all possible democratic revolutions emanating from 1908 in Turkey, if you were imagining that that moment of promise uh, of the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 did bring liberty and multiculturalism and equality through a new constitution in Turkey, I suppose you could imagine a thriving multicultural society. But it's hard to imagine that could happen, given what we know about the forces and factors inside Turkey and the Ottoman Empire at this time and with the uh, explosion of World War I as well that's going to happen, you know? So then I'm led to feel um, that, let's say the genocide wasn't carried out, then our Christian Armenian civilization, along with our fellow Christian our compatriots, the Greeks and the Assyrians, we would be hammered in a repressive totalitarian society. And we would be, we would have miserable lives, you know? And, and a lot of my Jewish colleagues and friends also often theorize, well, you know, what would I be doing if I were back there in the Ukraine and Belarus in a shtetl? And look what I'm doing in the U.S. You know, I'm X, Y, or, you know, the, the, the marvelous things that Jewish Americans have accomplished and that Armenian Americans accomplished. So there's some, there's some irony in the fact that, that the, the horrific catastrophe was part of a, a new phase or a new birth. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that's a good thing or anything like that. I'm just trying to meditate on irony and historical paradox, which is about the best way I could just reflect on your question. Is that it? Hi, Mr. Balakian, thank you. Um, just to continue the conversation about writing about the past, I'm curious about your approach. Um, do you ever feel like your interest in kind of documenting the past ever conflicts with your more personal interest in writing? Do you f feel like sometimes you have like a duty as an Armenian to retell the past? And does that ever kind of conflict with your, your interest in writing more personally? Well, I do want to make it clear. I know, I know, I know. I'm, you know, reading things here, and messages are moving quickly to you. But I, I want, I want to underscore that I write about a lot of things. You know, I write about love and sex and art and culture and food and the natural world, uh, birds and. Uh, uh, trees and the night sky, and uh, all, I, you know, I write about a lot of things, but the the weight of the Armenian past has a particular important place in the wider, you know, range of my work, and um, that's fine with me. That's how it's turned out. You know, you you answer your you answer your calling as a writer or as an artist. You you're a musician. You answer that calling, but I don't, you know. I think um, if you were to read through, I don't have a collected poems out. I do have an early selected called June Tree. I don't know. Maybe there's some books out there for sale later. It may be on the table. But if you look at June Tree, you'll see a lot of things, a lot of different pieces in my work. And you don't fully control it. You know, it speaks to you. You answer to it. And, you know, the muse of history uh, is important to me. I've also written about other histories. Other histories get into my poems. The Vietnam War, World War I, Native Americans in the 19th century. Uh, those things percolate in me. And so.
Thank you so much for the beautiful readings and the work that you have done. Uh, here is a question. I am a daughter of, of a survivor. My father was five years old when the uh, genocide happened. And when we were growing up, the stories of the genocide was so painful mm -hmm. to hear that me and my sisters, we would run away from the stories. And it was only after 30, 35 years that we started really trying to get the stories together, find out what happened and how did it happen. So my question to you is, we ran away from it for a long, long time. What is it that within the painful realities and the stories that you heard from your grandmom, what is, what is the driver that made you become the pain and the stories and the, and and everything that we ran away from? What is it that made you write about all this and uh, so beautiful, beautifully, if I may say so? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. You know, in my case, it's sort of the opposite because no one talked about the history openly. I mean, it was just shards and fragments and beguiling things and disconnects and dropped conversations. And my grandmother's folk tales and dreams weren't about 1915 in any particular way, but they were weird and eerie. And I came to read them more fully as an adult. So in, in a sense, the story in Black Dog of Fate is the story of a young man who's trying to uncover what was kept from him. And also then in my early 20s as a young writer, uh, I'm finding the discovery exciting. I mean, it's horrifying. The, the news is horrifying, but the discovery is powerful. It's big. It weighs a, it weighs a million pounds. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm a young poet. And I'm, you know, like any young writer, you, you feel the sky's the limit and you give, you're going after what you can to make art out of it. So I read you an early poem of mine tonight, The History of Armenia. I'm happy to say it's a poem that's gotten reprinted a lot. It's been recorded on CDs. It's a poem people have taken to. And I always felt that you know, that poem for me was really important because it, it allowed me to understand, feel that this horrific past that I was coming to, un to understand in my 20s was having an impact on my imagination and the tools of my craft to yield something that I hoped could be solid. You know, you don't want to make a solid object. A poem is an object. So it's really the sense of discovery a little later in life and the kind of being shielded from it when you were young that allowed my trajectory to go the way it was. I don't know how it would have been for me if I had grown up hearing a lot of things. I don't know what to say about that. It, it, it would have affected, you know, I wouldn't have been able to write Black Dog of Fate. I, it could not have happened. It's a book about breaking the unspoken open. Excuse me. Darn it. <laughs> Sorry. You mentioned your connection with Fresno, and as a child of Fresno, born and raised, I have to inquire. Um, and incidentally, my mother has called me from Fresno twice during your talk today. So maybe it's her speaking, I'm speaking, or she's speaking through me. But, um, you know, Fresno was one of those landing places post genocide that has an immediate connection post genocide generations, like several places such as New Jersey, New York, Boston, um, immediately after the genocide. So I don't know how much time you actually spent as a youth or in, as an adolescent or 
in your um, young adult life or maybe later in life how much time you spent there. But can you, if it's possible, if it did have any influence on you or what either in your individual development or in your artistic development, um, can you explore that a little bit as to what impact or influence Fresno or your experiences in Fresno had for you? Yeah, I, and I know you're 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 speaking next week at Fresno State, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I'm sorry, right now. <laughs> no, I haven't. But I'll see if I have a lozenge or something. I'll get to your question. Thanks for it. I just I got some. I got something caught in my throat. <clears> throat> Ah, uh, gosh, you know, I just never use open for. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Only if it's wrapped. I, I won't take it. This is wrapped, and I won't. I can't do it. I'm a germaphobe. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ann. I'm okay. <clears throat> sorry, I got something. Uh, uh, now you know all about me. I'm a germaphobe. He won't eat unwrapped candy. <clears throat> Uh, Fresno, yeah, so, um, well, going to Fresno as a kid in the early 1960s was, uh, it was, it was a great American experience first, <clears throat> because this was California. And it's true, back east, uh, as as the mamas and papas coined the phrase in 1967, a California dream, and it's kind of a real phenomenon. You know, the this land of beauty and sunshine and surf, and uh, later on, cultural revolution, sexual freedom, um, New Age vibes, all of that. <clears throat> that wasn't in my mind as a 10-year-old. So going to, going to California, going to Fresno, going to Yosemite, uh, going to Carmel, going to San Francisco, those were really like uh, uh, seminal experiences. I think Fresno on the Armenian cultural map uh, really comes to me first through Soroyan uh, and Soroyan's, and he, here it gives me a chance to speak to the power of literature and why literature matters. Because literature, uh, because the art of literary language and story and poem or play uh, stay, if they're done well, it stays. And it can define place in history in in I want to say dramatic but I mean that in literary terms I don't mean it in generic terms in in dramatic forms where you have dialogue and characters and scenes and images and poems <clears throat> so Soroyan's poems uh, Soroyan's poetic short stories made Fresno alive for me, and it, it made California alive for me. And the, and I came to, you know, be friendly with Bill, because he was a close friend of my Aunt Nona, who was one of the editors of the New York Times Book Review, and my Aunt Anna, who was a distinguished professor of French literature uh, at NYU. So, so Bill was close with Anna and Nona, and when he would come to New York, we would always get together. So I did get to know him, too, and he was a character. And I write about him in uh, Black Dog of Fate. Uh, and, um, yeah, Fresno was uh, really, there's some great scenes, Fresno scenes and Soroyan stories. I think it was only later when I came to Fresno as a grown-up, as a writer, that I got a a deeper feel for the Armenian cultural experience of Fresno. <clears throat> People would take me on the tour. So, uh, but 
these nodes on the Armenian map in this country are, they matter a lot. And so Fresno is one of them. Yeah, I am. I'll be there. I'm, I'm going to Fresno on Saturday. I'll be there for the weekend. Uh, reunion with my cousins and friends. And uh, it's a unique, unique. For somebody from the Northeast, that Central Valley agribiz is amazing. I mean, really. <clears throat> Thank you very much. How over the past 40 years have you seen or felt uh, the evolution of or the reception or sensitivity of the readers, the public to your writing, be it poetry, be it novels, um, the impact that yeah. your writing has had over the past four decades? How have you seen it? evolve or change? Well, I think one, uh, I mean, I, I'm grateful that, you know, my books continue to <clears throat> continue to come out and get reviewed and find readers. I'm really grateful. I'm, you know, I feel blessed to be part of the Armenian community because the Armenian community has been very important to my life and my work and to to have a kind of community in which your work can connect in ways that are deeper than a, a larger broader general world that's really uh been a gift uh, i think what's most exciting looking back over decades is the degree to which the Armenian discourse, as a discourse, has evolved and grown with such uh, depth and breadth. I mean, I remember where things were in the 1970s, and there were very few books uh, out there. Um, we all owe a great debt to Richard Hovhannisian because he was uh, certainly a pioneer in Armenian studies. Now, Armenian studies has its place in the academy. That matters. And UCLA has been such a, you know, landmark for it. But also that Armenian writers, artists, filmmakers, uh, playwrights, conceptual artists, journalists, nonfiction writers have taken off. That our story and our culture have a place that they never had. I, I, that's what I would verify. I remember when I, you know, my first books were books of poems. And they were, and also I had written a scholarly book. I am trained as a literary scholar, you know, so I write scholarly books now and then <clears throat> in, in, liter in American literature. I remember my editor said, I, you know, I've taken, a big, I've taken a big chance on this book. Um, how far out on a limb are we here? I've told HarperCollins that we'll do okay, but she, you know, she, she, I said, and I was just bluffing. I, I thought this, this book could disappear. <clears throat> this book could disappear in about three or four days, which is what happens to most books. Most books that are published in the trade world disappear in three or four days. I mean, there are thousands of books published every day. Well, anyway, it didn't have Black Dog of Fate took off and took off beyond my wildest dreams. You know, 10,000 copies sold in a month and then reprintings and reprintings and reprint, you know, whatever, TV, media. It's not just about, it's, I'm not trying to point the focus on me. It's just that, that that moment allowed me to understand that people in the mainstream business of book publishing didn't feel the Armenian story had a prayer. And when it started showing it did, it changed the life, you know, people wanted to start acquiring books by Armenian American writers. And I think that that's been happening and happening and happening. And if you just look every year, and if you compare it with what was happening 50 years ago, 40 years ago, even 30 years ago, it's been a big sea change. 
So I think that the creativity of our community and our intellectual and cultural resources in our community are makers of all kinds, filmmakers, sculptors, painters, poets, novelists, have shown up a hundred years after the arrests of our cultural leaders on the night of April 24. You know, and this is true in other diasporan communities around the world, but I think very much here in the US, in the English language, thank God for the English language, really. I mean, to write in the la language Shakespeare wrote in is, is, uh, is an honor. I wish I could write in Armenian, but I, I don't. <clears throat> but um, so I, I think there, I, th I think our, st our story has a much more prominent place. Our struggles politically for our nation in the South Caucasus are huge. And somehow we, all of us, and whatever the artist, writers, cultural component of our community can do to aid the cause in the South Caucasus, we have to do. And I think just by telling our, by putting an identity in our, on Armenia in the mainstream, it goes a long way. It matters. I could go on and on. I have a lot to say. About Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, again, Professor Peter Balakian, for a wonderful evening and for sharing your artistry with us. And thank you to our audience for your questions. Um, let me just mention that we do have a number of events that are coming up um, given the proximity to April 24. Um, some of them are events that we are putting on and others are, are co-sponsored events. There will be, for example, on Sunday, April 21, an in-person lecture at the Ararat Eskijin Museum uh, entitled Bone Memory, Armenian Pilgrimages to the Killing Fields of Derizor by Professor Elise Samerjan of Clark University. There will be a Zoom-based lecture um, this coming Monday, April 22 at 10 a.m. Uh, this is our... Um, Kevorkian annual lecture that is sponsored by the Richard Hovhannisian Chair in Modern Armenian History on the subject of looking back forward, Armenia in Lausanne, Nader of Diplomacy. And this lecture will be delivered by Professor Hans Lucas Kaiser of the University of Newcastle. We have another Zoom-based lecture that is sponsored by Nasser on Friday, April 26th at 11 uh, a.m. Pacific, and this one is entitled Monuments and Identities in the Caucasus, Karabakh, Nakhichevan, and Azerbaijan in Contemporary Geopolitical Conflict. This is a book talk by Dr. Igor Dorfman Lazarev and Khachaturian, uh, Harutun Khachaturian, as well as Dr. Marcelo Flores. And finally, on Monday, April 29 at 6 p.m. Pacific, our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute and the Armenian Genocide Research Program that is headed by Dr. Tanner Akcham will present a hybrid lecture, so in-person as well as Zoom-based, entitled The Right of the First Night and Sexual Violence Against Armenian Women in the 19th Century. This will be presented by one of our stellar uh, Armenian Genocide Research Program postdoctoral scholars, Dr. Anna Alexanian. And this will take place here on the UCLA campus, but in Bunch Hall on the 10th floor. So please do um, consult our Promise Armenian Institute website, social media um, for many upcoming events. I should also mention that in early May, the Aurora Prize a uh, humanitarian prize will actually be um, given here on the UCLA campus, and there will be several days of events surrounding that prize. That will actually be across the street in the Luskin Conference Center. So uh, thank you all again for your attendance. Special thanks once again to Hasmik Bagdasarian, 
um, and Nanora Hartunian for their uh, diligence in assisting us. And once again, thank you very much to Professor Peter Balakian for a wonderful talk. We look forward to sharing with you further at our reception afterwards. So thank you again.